Satish is a software architect at DataMe. And uh, he's been working in tech for 16 years now uh, across a bunch of languages. So languages seem to be his thing. He's come to go after switching through uh, Fortran, Pascal, COBOL, C++, Java, .NET, and now Go. And this, this taste for languages goes into spoken languages as well. Uh, so in his, in his own words, uh, he speaks French. He understands Spanish. He's learning German. <laughs> He's tried to learn Japanese and can read, write, and speak Hindi, Kannada, Malayalam, and Tamil. So, I mean, I'm very, very honestly, like I'm used to seeing, uh, you know, Desis, Indians speak uh, two or three languages. That's, that's not unusual, but to read, write, and speak is, is uh, impressive. And he says he's also got a little bit of English. So, <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, over to you. Thanks, man. Thank you. Am I audible on this right now? Okay, cool. Um, luckily for you, I, uh, for you, I think I'm going to speak uh, only in English today. Um, but uh, it's interesting that he gave me the introduction about the languages because today I'm quite passionate about Go itself um, because it really works. Okay, all these other things that I've gone through. They work to at a certain point in at a certain point in time, uh, for a certain set of technologies, um, for a certain kind of architecture. Then, over a period of time, you, you want to start discovering modern languages that work with modern systems, right? Uh, which is how I came upon Go about four years back, and since then, almost all my backend uh, has been always uh, in Go. Uh, at the same time, um, it is true that at the startup that I'm working at, we're using a, we've got a very uh, heterogeneous environment, even in terms of databases and languages. Uh, there's Java, there's uh, um, Node.js, there's Python, um, and there's obviously Go also. Um, so I just want to, uh, what I want to do today is to uh, try to tell you that your choice of language matters. Uh, it's probably something that you know already, but I'll try to uh, demonstrate it also for you partially. Uh, what also needs to be taken into consideration is where the world is today in terms of uh, software or uh, hardware, arc um, sorry, hardware infrastructure. So earlier, today we're, um, Today we are trying to move to a new office. And one of the questions somebody asked is, hey, where are we having the server room? Um, and he said, there is no server room. Because it's all on the cloud somewhere. And companies like DigitalOcean, um, from where uh, Matthew talked earlier, uh, companies uh, or uh, services like Google Compute Engine, AWS, they're giving a lot of, lot of power. Uh, there's a lot of raw hardware power that is available for, uh, to you uh, to actually use. But you'll also see that there are a few articles saying that they're shifting off the cloud. They're shifting off service levels sometimes, and they're having it in-house. Um, it's kind of weird, because all of us are shifting there, and a few people shifting back. Uh, is there a problem? Is there something that you can actually do better with a language like Go that allows you to actually use this uh, cloud infrastructure better, and therefore not only aid your organization, but uh, aid your revenues, aid your stock, everything? Um, to give you a few examples um, to start with, this was something recently announced by Google. Uh, they have actually, on their computer engine, um, increased their capacity. Um, they are able to today offer you 16 virtual CPUs, uh, 104 uh, GB of memory, uh, or 32 virtual CPUs, 208 GB of memory. This, these are amazing machines. These are really powerful machines. Uh, so also with um, DigitalOcean, AWS, all of them are increasing capacity. There's, there's a tremendous amount of uh, capacity that is available for you if you want to use it. Interestingly, you also need to pay for it. Okay, it doesn't come cheap. So um, in our company right now, uh, I'm talking not of uh, production systems that are deployed for the customer, but only POCs that are available for customers and for testing. Uh, we are spending close to $16,000 um, at a peak, and at a lowest level, maybe about $8,000. And these, like I'm saying, these are not production systems. They're not extremely highly scaled. These are simple systems. Uh, uh, we're using AWS right now. Most of them are T2 Micro. Um, at best, you know, an M3, uh, small M3 medium, this, as far as we go. And still, that's the kind of expenditure that we have to deal with. With that kind of money, you can get a swanky office here in Bangalore every month. Now, just as a comparison for cost, okay, now, Apple machines are not the one that you find in servers, obviously. Uh, but the machine that I have right now is on the far end. Okay, it's got, um, it's got a octa-core machine. Um, uh, I mean, it's got an octa-core um, CPU. Uh, it cost me about two lakhs. That's about three thousand dollars for those who are uh, looking at USD. This is the kind of uh, power that I have on this machine. But how much of it am I ac actually utilizing? 
What I'm going to try and do for you is, even though I'm not going to co connect to the cloud today, I'm just going to demonstrate for you here uh, how much these systems are being utilized and how much you're spending on hardware and how much your language is actually capable of utilizing that hardware and why in that process Go is a great choice. So, um, explain like I'm five. This is basically the cost of an infrastructure. Okay? Your yellow line is fixed. You've pretty much paid for infrastructure uh, once and um, it's, it's rare that you're going to uh, scale it automatically but typically you've paid at the beginning of the month uh, or you pay at the end of the month as is and that is fixed for you, right? Whereas your actual utilization of it fluctuates depends on, depending on the uh, amount of hits your website has or uh, the amount of hits your service gets. The other interesting thing is that infrastructure will meet your max usage. If it was there at the dotted level, any users or capacity that is required beyond that is going to get clipped. Okay, you're going to uh, lose users there uh, or if there's a churn in the application itself, it's going to take longer and longer to respond to users uh, or to the request that comes in. So what your manager or what your, your marketing team is going to say, we cannot afford to lose users. We cannot afford to slow it down for any request that comes in. It has to be instant uh, response. So you say increase the capacity. But increasing the capacity gives you just the benefit of the little triangle um, above the uh, dotted line. And all the rest basically becomes uh, waste. So if you can see the red lines, the blue part is where you get bang for the buck. Okay? You pay a certain amount of money, you're utilizing it, um, it works very well. All the red parts are basically where you get banged for the buck. Okay? If you, so you're not utilizing that money. So your CEO, CTO is going to come and say, why are we spending on all of this? Cut it down, cut it down. And this is actually happening in with us, right? We're saying a month we're spending $16,000 just for POCs. Doesn't make sense. Cut it down, lower it down. But of course, what you're going to get then is you're going to clip some of the users at the top. What is the preferred way then? You want to be able to utilize your resources better. Uh, it's something that companies like Google has done, obviously, right? Instead of going for high-end servers, they've taken a whole bunch of smaller, smaller capacity machines and then, uh, you know, uh, strung them together to get the kind of utilization at a lower cost. So what you want to do is you want to have your systems, you want to have your languages, pull down to the point where your application can do better with a smaller amount of infrastructure. They can do better with a smaller number of CPUs. They can do better with um, a lesser num amount of um, memory. So on the cloud, how can we use Go? And what could it be good for? The example I've given is something that I couldn't run on all machines. Uh, I tried it also in a few other languages. I'm not going to demonstrate all the languages here because uh, it doesn't, I didn't always get an apple to apple comparison, right? I mean, if I went, when I did this program in Java, uh, the default Java implementation automatically gives you a, uh, a lower, uh, what is the thing called? A lower quality JPEG, okay? And to get a 100% quality JPEG, you need to do special code. So what happened was that it was not an easy comparison compared to my Java, um, Go code uh, to do the same in Java. So I'm just going to show you the Go part, but you can go try it yourself with uh, Java and C Sharp and uh, Ruby and you know, uh, what are your languages choices. So in the demo that, or in the code that I did, uh, what I want to do was I want to do something that stresses the system quite a bit. So uh, create a large number of images in memory first, so that will load the uh, memory part. Make it reasonably big, uh, make it at high quality, 100%, and then save it out to disk. So I'll be stressing, uh, I'm assuming the CPU, I'll be stressing the memory, and I'll be also stressing the, um, the disk, the I.O. writes also. Just going to quickly show the code, there's not much to it, you know, with Go being so easy and clean to write. Um, the code is actually very little. I'm just creating a new image in memory, uh, making it all blue, and then saving it out. Okay. So that's the function is just two things, is to create the image in memory, send it back, and then save it out to disk. The rest of what I'm doing is merely to run it in a loop. So um, my first attempt as a comparison point is to uh, run it as a loop, a straight line loop. 
Um, all it does is the uh, same thing. It goes a thousand times, f uh, creating an image in memory, saving it out to disk, and then going to the next one. Okay. I'm going to show it to you running on the um, on the console. So what I have is, um, if you see the directory here, it's not very clear, is it? Um, if you see the directory here, one of them is where I've done the loop on the left side. The other one is where I've done a little more Go code to make it concurrent. Okay. Um, let me then just run it straight. It isn't very clear right now, maybe for you guys, but what's happening is on the right side is uh, where it's become it's running concurrent code, and the left side is where it's running straight loop code. This isn't going as smooth as I thought. Okay. Sorry, it had actually scrolled down. Um, incidentally, the one with the concurrent code is actually finished quite some time back. Um, and the one with the straight line code is still running. Uh, just finished right now. Okay, the, the one which was concurrent took about 10 seconds, 10.7 uh, close to 11 seconds. Uh, and the other one uh, took 39 point something close to 40 seconds. Uh, there is, in, um, in running this earlier, I got similar results. Those are a little better right now, but I had more uh, applications running earlier. And this is what I saw when I, run, ran, uh, sorry, when I was running the straight line code. It took about 42 seconds to create 1,000 images and save it out a disk. But the interesting part is how my CPU was loaded. You can see that about only half the number of cores are actually being utilized. The other $1,500 that I spent on the machine is actually lying waste. So you can see that in using languages that do not support great uh, threading concepts or easy uh, concurrency, this is what you're going to get. Because you're not going to be trying a whole lot of um, concurrent programming or parallel programming in languages that uh, are difficult to actually teach and maintain and help you know, your peers work on. So then I made it uh, concurrent. And uh, for those who have already done this before, it's very easy, right? The main thing I did was add where it was calling image work earlier. I'm just calling go image work. And just to make sure that the program doesn't immediately exit, I'm also doing a sync wait group. So at the beginning, I say for every uh, process I started, I wait for it to finish at the end and then conclude all together. In running this, you saw it already in action. The, the difference uh, was about one-fourth to one-third. That's kind of what I'm seeing when I write concurrent code. So in this, when I ran it earlier, I got it in about 14 seconds. But again, the interesting point is how much shorter, uh, how much shorter the actual running time is because more of the capacity is being used. So if you want a reference point, this is what it was earlier. Half the code is being used and being used for a much longer time. And this, all code is being used and for a much uh, shorter time. A configuration like this is what you're likely to have on your cloud server, right? Whether it's DigitalOcean or AWS or Google Compute. And imagine this happening now for 500,000 users or a million users, all of them coming together. How much better will the response be uh, when you use something with this kind of language fundamentals? What it then did was, does it actually scale to the cloud? Uh, what I said earlier about going from the machine, which is maybe reasonably small, to something that is uh, powerful. So I went and provisioned on the Google Compute Engine. They didn't allow me to do 32 CPU with 208 GB memory. You need to get special permission for that. I didn't have that. So I went with a 16 uh, virtual CPU and 104 GB of memory. And again, the results are dramatic. In short, what, I'm, uh, what I did there is this result. Okay. When I did... Uh, straight line coding on my machine, it, was, it went from 42 seconds to about 37 seconds on the uh, Google Compute Engine. It's almost the same, um, which was actually quite surprising for me. I thought I'll be going at least maybe half, 
uh, but really just doing straight line coding doesn't help or that kind of looping for a large amount of uh, um, what you're processing really is not I, I couldn't see the benefits of it but when I went go routine on my local machine it went from 42 to uh, 14 seconds and then when I did the same thing on the Google computer engine it was just dramatic it's like less than 90 percent of the cost uh, of processing um, that I saw on my machine with uh, straight line coding but even with the other one the local thing is still a dramatic uh, drop in time to do the same amount of processing. So on machines when you're having all this provisioned power, you can see that you'll be utilizing your hardware and you're getting much, much, a much, much better bang for the buck when you're using good, good languages that support the kind of um, concurrency or hardware utilization that Java does, uh, sorry, that Go does. Um, I wanted to compare this thing. It does not do it with Java, some other things as easily, you know, because in doing this before also, uh, we had to write like a Bluetooth stack long back, um, and we had we wrote it in uh, Java, and I owned one completely. And that time I was a junior programmer, and you can see that even there, um, or with some of the other um, applications that we did, we never went uh, with doing a large amount of uh, threads because it loaded the system so much. Um, and this is why I got confused uh, earlier, but it's, um, this is something that my boss said. You know, uh, this is about 10 years ago, um, and, um, or a little more than that. And he said, uh, you know, why are people obsessing over Java? Ja it's a thing in India, actually, for those who are not familiar, to say Java, Shava, uh, Java, Shava, big deal. It's all the same, you know. Uh, just get the job done. Um, but, and that time I kind of thought he was right, but the more and more I learned, I realized this is not true. Uh, your choice of language matters, um, and good program, uh, good programming languages, good with good programming uh, principles, actually affect the um, output of what even my boss wants. Like he wants it a great uh, response at a lower cost. He will get it with better languages instead of saying Java, Java. It doesn't matter uh, to actually dedicate some time to finding out something that works and then invest in it. Uh, why does this work? Um, you might know some of this already. Um, unlike some of the other languages, um, Go, um, Go is not using threads exclusively. It actually it uses concurrent processes or coroutines or goroutines that actually sit um, within a thread itself and can have many of those running um, within a thread itself. So if you're running, say, something like Java, the, the cost of actually running it is, one, you've got the VM, which will take tens of MB by itself. And for every thread that you spin off, it's going to take a few more MB to, um, to just get it started. And then beyond that is the processing that you have within it. Uh, with Go, on the other hand, because of um, you know, multiplexing a lo lot of these core routines within the thread itself, the resources are used are less. Um, the rest of it, I don't need to really go over. But um, if you go into the details, you, just, you can see that the efficiency from using core routine, uh, Go routines is uh, way beyond what you would get from using threads. I'm not the only one to say this, actually. Um, even long back, um, INIO came out with an article on how they had dropped their servers from 30 to just two. Um, and uh, he, the, the founder of that says even the second one was just for redundancy. So they were able to bring down the servers um, close to 94, 95%. Um, and that's the amount of savings you're going to get as a business. Uh, there's another thing that I uh, read recently. Uh, again, you're seeing the same pattern everywhere. By using Go, they're able to bring down the cost of uh, infrastructure. So what you're seeing is, as, at least as far as the demo goes, you can see that it's getting uh, increased speed, and you're also reducing the cost significantly. But honestly, this is not the only thing. I want to focus on one aspect of uh, Go and how it's actually helping me make a better decision and you know, try to evangelize Go within my company. Uh, but the big picture is a lot more, right? I mean, you're getting all those other things also that, that Go is great for. Um, easy deployment. Uh, in my team, actually, um, I, own the, I own a part that is going, that's an entire stack. Um, we've got a backend running in Go uh, with MySQL uh, as a database, which you're probably changing to something else soon. Uh, I also have the front end, um, so I write the JavaScripts, the HTML, the CSS, uh, the SQL, the Go, the shell scripts, I write all of that. Uh, and trust me, with the team that I have, the, many of them are juniors actually, uh, just off college, 
I have not had a problem with them uh, when they work with Go. It's very clear for them um, what needs to be done. We haven't had errors over there, whereas I'm, I'm stressed every day with JavaScript. I don't have a choice. Um, I'm trying to move to TypeScript now, but even then, you know, when you try to do something in a, a place, it takes time. You need to teach them uh, TypeScript next and make sure that it works. So I'm in the process of trying that out, hopefully. Um, and because Angular 2 is also written in TypeScript, and we are using Angular, when the shift comes, we might be, you know, it might be a good time to shift to TypeScript. But um, Go has been no problem for me. Okay, it's only, the only problem has been actually getting people only doing Java or Node.js before to actually start thinking about Go. Um, but that's more of a, uh, it's not a language thing. It's nothing to do with the language itself. So um, I'm seeing much more maintainable code. Um, the barriers to adoption within the team, the barriers to teach um, are much less. Everybody is able to do concurrent programming if I ask them to. You know, so when somebody did some, uh, from, we are rewriting some part of the code for efficiency. We did straight line code, and now we are saying uh, just move it to uh, um, you know, make it concurrent. It's, it's very simple. I just show them a couple of steps and we are done. Um, this is also great. I know this is something that uh, Rob Fike talks about uh, every once in a while, about evolutionary code that grows with your application itself. I have actually seen this happen. Um, when we get a larger number of, um, or the, when the application itself grows uh, horizontally, to get more and more features, Go is really helping. It's much more easier to do in that. Uh, and of course, easier scaling the kind that I showed you. Uh, with that, I'll stop, and I've got a few minutes for questions then. Thank you. Oh. So I have a comment. So uh, sure, I mean, concurrency will definitely help. But I think you saw very dramatic results because uh, you were doing two things. One is, which is very CPU intensive, and the other is disk intensive. So you were, when you do it serial, you're actually blocked on the disk I.O. And hence, when you actually made it concurrent, you saw these dramatic results. But yeah. in general, I mean, you may not see uh, this level of improvement, probably with concurrency. If it's, I mean, in your case, it was really dramatic because of disk I.O. Yeah. So I just wanted to. Yeah, I, I think uh, you might be right, you know, because when, you, when I also did the same thing with, say, very simple processing, um, in the beginning, the results aren't very dramatic, you know. Um, but it actually helps to see what happens at the, at the top, you know, that, that's kind of what we're trying to reach, right? Like, when the amount of processing increases that, to that extent, like, I was, I was writing software uh, to do some video processing, okay? Um, I wanted to subtitle videos automatically. I was doing some amount of OCR, uh, optical character recognition, uh, for, um, for, uh, for summary. So there's a large amount of that kind of processing that, that exists over there. So you might be right. Um, I don't have a particular example for what you're saying, uh, but we'll leave it at that. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks for the great talk, Satish. Uh, actually, thanks. as you have worked with a lot of different languages, yeah. so I was just wondering, do you have any idea of, uh, when, when it comes to concurrency, uh, using Go versus something like pure functional languages like Clojure or, or Lang would make a difference? I, um, the la so uh, let me be very open. There's a few languages that I haven't worked uh, quite extensively on. Uh, one is Python. I did it for a little amount of scripting and all that, but uh, really I didn't, I didn't pick it up. Um, I haven't also tried some of the newer ones like Clojure. I won't really try Rust, uh, but uh, in the last two, three years that I've uh, gotten on this new job, um, it's been very difficult to go explore new things. You know, we're just building a lot of applications in a very short time. But I do want to try some of those things. Though um, some of the languages that uh, are already resting on Java as a base is something that slightly turns me off. I mean, I'm not very sure if, I, if I'm going to pick it up, uh, um, you know, soon, or if I'm going to attempt it soon. Uh, Rust, though, is something that I want to try. Erlang is something that I want to try. A lot of people have been talking about it. I think, um, yeah, uh, there's always, because there seems to be a certain similarity, um, I do want to try it out, but I haven't had a big project to try. I've tried small bits of code, you know, uh, but I haven't tried anything big enough to make a useful comparison. Thanks, Satish. Okay. Uh, hi, uh, you hey. showed me uh, there are uh, sequential versus parallel processes. For second one, you did the go routine for each operation, right? Yeah. Uh, created uh, created uh, parallelly, completely you're creating go routine for every operation. So 
Have you created anything pool of core teams? I mean, it may increase the performance or something. Uh, have you created a pool of? Pool of core teams. Instead of creating core teams for each operation, yeah. they, they loop. So you have to see the performance when it's some core teams. Yeah, yeah. So have you tried with some pool of core No, I didn't actually. Uh, one of the things I did want to do is when I was comparing these languages, right, I wanted to make sure that I had almost an apples to apples comparisons in terms of uh, different languages. And honestly, I ha because I haven't done um, a lot of thread programming except long back in C, um, in Java and uh, .NET I haven't done any at all. Um, I did not have um, a reasonable comparison level. Also, I didn't try anything that was very different. What I did though, was I sent this request to other people, people who are experts in Java and Python, and said, can you give me the program that does the same thing? Um, so um, that is what I did to get a reasonable comparison. What you uh, said about pooling them, I did not try it. Sorry. Uh, final question, please. Yeah. So uh, just to add, if you wanted an apples to apples comparison with Java, uh, yeah. It would be interesting to see the same thing with like a thread pool executor in Java with like as many threads as number of CPUs and similar amount of threads in Go with a pool of Go routines. That could probably give you a similar kind of a comparison between the two. Fair enough. I mean, I'm willi if you're willing to write a bit of the code for me and we can compare it also, I'm it's completely fun, open. I guess. Yeah, definitely. Which is why, you know, like instead of being, I'm slightly opinionated, opinionated about Go today, but just to reduce that bias, I requested others to do this for me uh, just so that people are working on that exclusively today will be able to give me a better comparison. So I will take it up again. Um, I can check it out. Okay. All right. Hey, thanks, man. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Can we have a hand, please?